Sometimes, a revocable trust or an estate could be the seller in a transaction involving real estate, especially residential real estate. But there's cautionary tales that go along with any sort of real estate sale, including obligations to disclose defects or known problems with the property. Today we're going to look at a cautionary tale in an Oklahoma Supreme Court case, Rickard v. Coolamore. As always, before we jump into the presentation, I want to remind you that this is not intended to substitute for legal or tax advice and is provided for educational purposes only. So as an intro, anytime you sell residential real property, many states impose disclosure obligations on the seller. So if you've ever been through a sale or purchase of residential real estate, you may recall the disclosure statement where the, the seller needs to say what's wrong with the property. What do they know of that's gone on in the past? Has there been mold? Has there been asbestos? You know, has there been lead-based paint? Anything like that. Now, this seems onerous. It seems like it could be a bad thing in that if you disclose, it could lower the purchase price or open you up to liability as a seller. But disclosure helps to limit that liability. And it also limits some of the damages that can be claimed even if you fail to disclose. So for example, a buyer couldn't claim what are known as exemplary or punitive damages for your failure to disclose. Now, this presentation doesn't cover all 50 states, and I'm not an expert on real estate, real property disclosures. All I intend to do here is examine a recent Oklahoma Supreme Court case where a sale by a fiduciary of a revocable trust created an issue. To reveal the issues that can pop up possibly when there is a fiduciary, like a personal representative or executor of an estate or a trustee of a trust involved in the sales process. In other words, does that fiduciary have the duty to disclose or are they exempt? And is exemption a good thing? It may not be because as we'll see, it may allow a buyer to pursue, for example, punitive damages. Now to set the stage, revocable trusts are a common estate planning tool that individuals and families use often to avoid probate. The intent is that you can put property into the trust during your lifetime and by doing so that property avoids probate. Now, oftentimes the creators of the trust, the settlers may live in one state or they want to avoid probate but they may also own real estate in another state where they also want to avoid probate. Because not only do you have a probate in your state potentially where you are domiciled at the time of your death, but you also may have to have a probate in each state in which you individually own real estate or even personal property. So by transferring any out-of-state real estate to your revocable trust, you can avoid what's known as ancillary probate, which is a probate in a state other than the state in which you live. And that's what was involved in this case of Rickard v. Coolamore. So what happened is that Coolamores had previously purchased and owned a residence in Oklahoma, but they were residents of Washington. So they never lived in this residence in Oklahoma. Instead, they transferred it into their revocable living trust. And in the meantime, their daughter and their daughter's family occupied the residence. And that was immaterial in the grand scheme of things. What really mattered is that the Coolamores had never lived there. And at all times, under this revocable trust, they were still living. They were the settlers, trustees, and beneficiaries of this revocable trust. So in their capacity as trustees of this revocable trust, they sold the property to the buyer, Rickard. And after the, the sale had closed, Rickard discovered several bad undisclosed effects relating to prior flooding issues, drainage issues, and water damage in the house, and sued to recover the damages, the, the lost value in the house, presumably maybe even some punitive damage damages for the failure to disclose. So to get to the appeal part, since this was in the Oklahoma Supreme Court, they essentially wanted two different things. The Coolamores wanted Oklahoma's statutory disclosure law to apply, but what they're doing is seeking a judgment that one, they had no duty to disclose, and that two, Rickard as the buyer had waived the right to seek damages because the buyer had waived any inspection rights uh, or any right to claim those types of things at the closing of the purchase. However, on the other side, the buyer, Rickard, didn't want the statutory disclosure law to apply and sought a judgment saying that the revocable trust was exempt from 
from that statutory disclosure law in Oklahoma, which would expand the damages that Rickard could pursue to include just general common law contractual remedies, which presumably, although not stated here, might include punitive damages. What happened is that the trial court agreed with Rickard, the buyer, and the Coulomores, the settlers and trustees of this revocable trust, appealed. So the big question here was whether the revocable trust or its trustees were exempt from that disclosure statute such that general damages could come into play. Now within the statute, there was an express exemption under Oklahoma law stating in part that the disclosure law didn't apply to a sale by a fiduciary who was not an owner occupant of the property. So what happened is that the Coulomores really dug into this exemption and dissected the statutory language to try to argue that the exemption somehow didn't apply. So they had a three-pronged attack and the court struck them down on all three points. First, the definition of quote-unquote fiduciary was involved, to which the Coulomores argued since they wore all the hats since this was a revocable trust where there were settlers and beneficiaries and trustees of the trust, and since they had a right to revoke the trust, what they try to argue is that it's, it's as if they were the individual owners of this property, that they're true owners, and that they weren't really acting as fiduciaries. But the court refused to read extra into the statute. So there was nothing in the statute or the legislative record that expanded or contracted or limited the definition of fiduciary. Really, it just said a fiduciary, nothing more, nothing less. So what the court said is that there's nothing in the record that shows that there was any legislative intent to exclude revocable trust here. And we're not going to read the minds of the, the Oklahoma legislature and try to say that there was an intent to exclude revocable trusts in this exemption. So next, they jump to the definition of owner-occupant, because remember, the exemption applies to a fiduciary who's not an owner-occupant. But the Coulomores argued that at one point they had actually been owners, even though they'd never been occupants. And what they'd done is take their individual ownership and transfer it to the revocable trust. So they tried to read this as being, uh, I guess, applicable to an owner or an occupant. They refused to read the two terms together. They said, since there was no hyphen or anything, or implied since there was no hyphen, that there was uh, an intent that... W that the fiduciary exemption wouldn't apply to somebody who had been an owner or an occupant. But the court disagreed again, and the court noted that the term owner-occupant appeared to be conjunction conjunctive and not disjunctive. So in other words, what the court refused to do was insert the word or between the terms owner and occupant if the legislator had not done so. Finally, they really dug into the scope of the fiduciary's role as couched within the terms of the statute itself. And what the Coulomores tried to argue is that there, were, there was more to this exemption. That It noted that a fiduciary who wasn't an owner-occupant was exempt from the statute if they're a fiduciary acting in the course of the administration of a decedent's estate, a guardianship, a conservatorship, or a trust. Now, since the trust was revocable, they argued, they, by the, I mean the Coulomores, argued that the use of the term decedent's estate means that this fiduciary exception would not apply until their deaths, until the trust becomes irrevocable, since at that point it becomes kind of like a replacement for their estate as decedents. But the court didn't agree either on this point. Once again, the court refused to read extra into the statute, and the court noted that guardianships and conservatorships or trusts, as noted in the rest of the statutes, can apply in situations where there is somebody living, where there is no decedent. So they didn't want to add that extra layer in to limit this to only apply to a fiduciary acting after the death of a decedent. So overall, Coulomore's lost, and the key takeaway here is that what this did is open up the scope of damages. So it seems good, maybe, at first glance that a revocable trust or an estate might be exempt from this disclosure law. But the disclosure law is designed not to just to protect buyers, but also maybe to limit the liability of sellers as well. So it's important to note, if you're representing 
a fiduciary of an estate or trust who's selling real property that you need to maybe explore whether the property disclosure statute applies to that particular uh, fiduciary and to know whether it expands or limits one the fiduciary's liability or two the scope or even existence of the disclosure obligations which might apply to an individual owner now just because these types of statutes don't apply doesn't mean that's a good thing remember this can just kick you out of limited damages within the statutory scheme into more general contractual liability and that could be expanded into punitive damages now it's not often that punitive damages can apply in a contractual setting but in real property especially residential real property there could be some things like psych psychological disclosures like maybe somebody had been murdered in the residence or something like that and that could expand the scope of damages as relates to a buyer purchasing a home because anything like that keeps them from being comfortable uh, physically and psychologically in their brand new home which could really open up the door to punitive damages and you want to avoid that because once you do that you end up in the wild wild west of liability as always, if you have questions or topic suggestions, you can email those to me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com with the caveat that I cannot give tax or legal advice in response to your questions. But thank you again for listening to this presentation, and I look forward to seeing you in my future content.